who blew up Nord Stream? <laughs> you for sure. I was busy that day. Uh, I did not blow up Nord Stream. Uh, <laughs> thank you, though. You have issues on the border, issues with migration, issues with the national debt. You have nothing better to do, so you should fight in Ukraine. The Tucker Putin interview was last night, and I have a lot of takeaways from it. I'm not here to make conclusions about Putin, but what I will say is that I don't think he's the crazed, warmongering madman that the Western media makes him out to be. I don't think he's a saint by any means. I'm not just gonna trust a national leader's word 100%, but from an objective standpoint, a lot of what was discussed raises some interesting questions and it's prompted me to really look into it. I think he made a lot of good points, reasonable points that indicate he wants peace, he's offering solutions and ways to end this war, which the US is not doing a very good job at, and I think he's very knowledgeable of his country's history, which gives this talk a very solid foundation. One thing is certain, I think he's operating on an intellectual plane far above most US politicians. Before we get into the highlights from this interview, if you're new to this channel, please be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell for more videos. Help us build the inverted world community. Now, Tucker wanted to start this off with the question that was on all of our minds. Why did Putin invade Ukraine two years ago? We need to know how this was justified. But instead of giving the straight up answer right away, Putin took almost a half hour to explain the history of Ukraine and Russia dating back to the 9th century. At first, this wasn't something I was interested in hearing. Even Tucker was annoyed by this initially in the interview. He didn't see the relevance, but then later understood that when Ukraine became independent, there was a lot of dispute over how the borders were drawn. And Putin now believes that Russia does have a historic claim to parts of Western Ukraine. For over a thousand years, Russian and Ukrainian people have shared the same lineage and culture. The separation between the two was the result of several conflicts spanning decades, but the common heritage remains. Putin goes into great detail explaining this history as it provides context for Russia's invasion in the name of protecting a common people. To this day, a majority of the population in the Donbass region identifies as Russian and not Ukrainian. Towards the end of all this, Putin essentially makes the claim that the state of Ukraine was an artificial state created by the Soviet Union after World War II, with parts of land that had previously belonged to Hungary and Romania. So before the Bolsheviks took power, Ukraine was never meant to be independent from Russia because the culture and the lineage was always the same. The communists tried to erase their own people's history through the means of divide and conquer. Sounds familiar, right? So I'm sitting there watching this and thinking, what do the events of 862 AD have to do with what is going on currently? But then I realized that most Americans lack historical context when it comes to global affairs, and this is how we are just so easily manipulated. We have to know how it started to really understand where we are now. I have to admit though, it was long. I think Putin could have done a better job at summarizing the history, but at the same time, there was no time limit on the interview, and I'm glad that Putin got to speak freely. How often do we get to hear from Putin directly, and explaining a thousand years of history is not something that a typical politician will do. Putin can talk about all of this from memory, and Biden can't even remember what he had for breakfast. As we get closer to the present era, Putin tells a few stories about how he tried to build peaceful relations with the West. When Putin became president in 2000, he asked Bill Clinton personally if Russia should join NATO. At a meeting here in the Kremlin with the outgoing President Bill Clinton, right here in the next room, I said to him, I asked him, do you think if Russia asked to join NATO, do you think it would happen? Suddenly he said, you know, it's interesting. I think so. But in the evening when we met for dinner, he said, you know, I've talked to my team. No, no. It's not possible now. I wonder what the reason for that was, and why weren't they able to build relations in other means since then? In a similar instance, Putin was also rejected when discussing with George Bush Sr. the idea of the United States, Russia, and Europe working together on a missile defense system. That system was supposedly created by the US to prevent threats from Iran, but could also be used against Russia. I suggested working together, Russia, the United States, and Europe. They said it was very interesting. They asked me, are you serious? I said, absolutely. Then Secretary of Defense Gates, 
former director of CIA and Secretary of State Rice came in here, in this cabinet, right here at this table. They sat on this table. They said to me, yes, we have thought about it. We agree. I said, thank God, great, but with some exceptions. So twice you've described U.S. presidents making decisions and then being undercut by their agency heads. So it sounds like you're describing a system that's not run by the people who are elected in your telling. That was a great question by Tucker, implying the deep state's nefarious role in the government. It actually seems that Putin has become very crippled by the rejection of NATO and the West. These failed relations between the US, Russia, and the Ukrainian conflict can be squarely blamed on the CIA and the deep state. Now I understand why the establishment was deathly afraid of this interview. So finally, we arrive at the question as to what Putin's motives were for the invasion in February 2022. So what was the trigger for you? What was the moment where you decided you had to do this? Initially, it was the coup in Ukraine that provoked the conflict. The coup that Putin is referring to was the removal of Ukraine President Viktor Yanukovych in 2014, following deadly protests in response to Viktor pulling out of an EU trade agreement. President Yanukovych agreed to all conditions. He was ready to hold an early election, which he had no chance of winning, frankly speaking. Everyone knew that. I can't confirm this to be true, but according to Putin, this coup was assisted by the CIA. Then why the coup? Why the victims? Why threatening Crimea? Why launching an operation in Donbas? This I do not understand. That is exactly what the miscalculation is. CIA did its job to complete the coup. We would have never considered to even lift a finger if it hadn't been for the bloody developments on Maidan. We never agreed to NATO's expansion and, moreover, we never agreed that Ukraine would be in NATO. And what triggered the latest events? Firstly, the current Ukrainian leadership declared that it would not implement the Minsk agreements, which had been signed, as you know, after the events of 2014 in Minsk, where the plan of peaceful settlement in Donbas was set forth. I honestly believe that if we managed to convince the residents of Donbas, and we had to work hard to convince them to return to the Ukrainian statehood, then gradually the wounds would start to heal. When the pensions and social benefits were paid again, all the pieces would gradually fall into place. Nobody wanted that. Everybody wanted to resolve the issue by military force only, but we could not let that happen. And the situation got to the point when the Ukrainian side announced, no, we will not do anything. They also started preparing for military action. It was they who started the war in 2014. Our goal is to stop this war. And we did not start this war in 2022. This is an attempt to stop it. A lot of this I didn't know. It seemed like Putin was doing a lot to prevent this war from happening, but Ukraine insisted that the only way to get independence for the Donbass region was military force. As much as I don't agree with this war, I can understand why Russia has chosen to go to war. Russia has made several attempts to diplomatically integrate with the West, and those attempts have been repeatedly rebuffed and undermined. The expansion of NATO, despite agreeing with Russia not to do so, the violation of the Minsk agreements, and other factors have provoked Russia into war. Putin has made many attempts to negotiate peace since the invasion began, but have also been rejected. It turns out that British Prime Minister Boris Johnson sabotaged a peace deal with the Ukraine, which would have ended the war 18 months ago. The negotiation group leader, Mr. Arachamiya is his last name, I believe still has the faction of the ruling party, the party of the president in the Rada. He even put his preliminary signature on the document I am telling you about. But then he publicly stated to the whole world, we were ready to sign this document, but Mr. Johnson, then the Prime Minister of Great Britain, came and dissuaded us from doing this, saying it was better to fight Russia. Why is it in Boris Johnson's interest to keep the war going? Well, because he was acting on behalf of the Biden administration. And that's why I asked about dealing directly with the Biden administration, which is making these decisions, not President Zelensky of Ukraine. If the Zelensky administration in Ukraine refused to negotiate, I assume they did it under the instruction from Washington. If Washington believes it to be the wrong decision, let it abandon it. Let it find a delicate excuse so that no one is insulted. Let it come up with a way out. 
Пусть они от него отказываются. It was not us who made this decision. One of Putin's goals is also to denazify Ukraine. After gaining independence, Ukraine began to search, as some Western analysts say, its identity. And it came up with nothing better than to build this identity upon some false heroes who collaborated with Hitler. These people have been made into national heroes in Ukraine. Monuments to those people have been erected. They are displayed on flags. Their names are shouted by crowds that walk with torches, as it was in Nazi Germany. Putin here is referring to groups like Azov Battalion, who are literal neo-Nazis fighting on the front lines in this war. I have not seen the pro-Ukraine media denounce this group once since the conflict began. He also mentions when the Canadian Parliament, along with Zelensky, gave a standing ovation to a man who fought for a Nazi military unit during World War II. So who is really on the wrong side of history here? Putin also confirms that Russia has no interest in invading Poland, Latvia, Georgia, or anywhere else in the world. Another fear-mongering theory propped up by the Western media. Tucker also asks about the sabotage of the Nord Stream pipeline, and the initial response was actually pretty funny. Who blew up Nord Stream? <laughs> you for sure. I was busy that day. <laughs> Nate, it, do you have... Do you have <laughs> uh, I did not blow up Nord Stream. Uh, <laughs> thank you, though. You personally may have an alibi, but the CIA has no such alibi. Do, do you have evidence that NATO or the CIA did it? You know, I won't get into details, but people always say in such cases, look for someone who is interested. But I'm confused. I mean, that's the biggest act of industrial terrorism ever and it's the largest emission of CO2 in, in history. Okay, so if you had evidence, and presumably given your security services, your intel services, you would, that NATO, the US, CIA, the West did this, why wouldn't you present it and win a propaganda victory? In the war of propaganda, it is very difficult to defeat the United States because the United States controls all the world's media and many European media. The ultimate beneficiary of the biggest European media are American financial institutions. Don't you know that? So it is possible to get involved in this work, but it is cost prohibitive, so to speak. We can simply shine the spotlight on our sources of information and we will not achieve results. Was the US involved? I don't know for sure, but one thing that's suspicious is that the US didn't conduct any investigation whatsoever. Remember when Biden said that if he had to destroy Nord Stream, he would? If Russia invades, uh, that means tanks or troops crossing the, uh, the, the border of Ukraine uh, again, then uh, there, will be, uh, we, there will be no longer uh, Nord Stream 2. We, we will bring an end to it. But how will you, how will you do that exactly since the project and control of the project is within Germany's control? We will. Uh, I promise you we'll be able to do it. Doesn't sound like the U.S. is innocent. Seymour Hirsch, a former New York Times reporter who won a Pulitzer and numerous other awards for his investigative journalism, published an article on Substack describing how the U.S. Navy executed a covert operation in the Baltic Sea. Hirsch's article was summarized on Quora, detailing the possible motives for sabotaging the pipeline. The decision to bomb the pipelines was made in secret by U.S. President Joe Biden to cut off Moscow's ability to earn billions of dollars from natural gas sales to Europe. The U.S. believed that the pipelines gave Russia political leverage over Germany and Western Europe that could be used to weaken their commitment to Ukraine after the Russia-Ukraine conflict began, according to Hirsch. Since the outbreak of the Russia-Ukraine conflict, Russia would have an additional and much needed major source of income for transporting and selling natural gas to Europe and Germany and the rest of Western Europe would become addicted to low-cost natural gas supplied by Russia while diminishing European reliance on America. Plunging Russian gas supplies have caused prices to soar in Europe, where countries have struggled to find alternative energy supplies to heat homes, generate electricity, and run factories. I posted a link to the full article in the description below if you want to learn more about how this could have been done. But whether it's true or not, why didn't the US launch some sort of investigation? Because if it wasn't America, then shouldn't we try to find out who? Now, very important topic here, Tucker asks Putin about the collapse of the US dollar. And Putin makes it clear that the reason for this is using the dollar as a means of maintaining global dominance. That doing so has only continued to back 
backfire on the U.S. The U.S. dollar, which has kind of united the world uh, in a lot of ways, maybe not to your advantage, but certainly to ours, <laughs> is that going away as the reserve currency, the, the, common, the universally accepted currency? How have sanctions, do you think, changed the dollar's place in the world? To use the dollar as a tool of foreign policy struggle is one of the biggest strategic mistakes made by the U.S. political leadership. It is the main weapon used by the United States to preserve its power across the world. As soon as the political leadership decided to use the U.S. dollar as a tool of political struggle, a blow was dealt to this American power. The fact that the United States applies restrictive measures to certain countries, such as placing restrictions on transactions, freezing assets, etc., causes grave concern and sends a signal to the whole world. It damages the U.S. economy, undermines the power of the United States across the world. Other countries, including oil producers, are thinking of and already accepting payments for oil in yuan. Do you even realize what is going on or not? Yeah, basically, why try to restrict transactions to the U.S. dollar when it's only causing serious blows to our own economy? More countries are looking to purchase oil in yuan thanks to us. The collapse of the dollar when that happens will be our own doing. But maybe that's by design because maybe it's a way to usher in digital currency, which is just looking more and more inevitable. This next and final clip is probably the most impactful moment from the interview because it speaks directly to Americans and the frustrations that so many of us have had about the war and the billions of taxpayer dollars going towards it. Why are we putting the interests of Ukraine before our own? Do the United States need this? What for? Thousands of miles away from your national territory. Don't you have anything better to do? You have issues on the border, issues with migration, issues with the national debt, more than 33 trillion dollars. You have nothing better to do, so you should fight in Ukraine? Wouldn't it be better to negotiate with Russia? Make an agreement? Already understanding the situation that is developing today? Realizing that Russia will fight for its interests to the end? And realizing this, actually return to common sense, start respecting our country and its interests, and look for certain solutions. It seems to me that this is much smarter and more rational. Wow. Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, is sounding more America first than Biden or any of these other politicians funding Ukraine. He really hits the nail on the head. Why don't you focus on fixing the southern border or fixing the national debt? instead of getting caught up in all these other foreign affairs? Why are you letting your economy suffer by supplying weapons to other nations? Whether you like Putin or not, I think this is something most of us can agree on. At this point, we need to stop pointing fingers at each other and figure out a way to stop this war. The White House told us not to believe a word that Putin says in this interview. Well, frankly, I don't believe anything the White House is telling us either. You haven't exactly earned my trust for that, okay? Maybe they should try to debunk some of Putin's claims for me to be convinced. More importantly, why isn't Biden talking to Putin and trying to negotiate? Under Trump, this conflict would not have happened because he is a master negotiator. There were no new wars started under his watch and our nation was stronger than ever. There were no new wars started under his watch and our nation was stronger than ever. So even if Russia attempted to do something crazy, we would have been sending the right message that not only would we prevent an attack from happening on U.S. soil, but also that NATO wouldn't have to encroach on Russia. Our government has betrayed us completely. We have been led to believe that peace is unattainable when it is literally a phone call away. Biden needs to pick up the phone and end this war. I am sick and tired of working overtime and draining our country of resources to prop up this completely unnecessary war. Whew. Anyway, that's my analysis. Uh, I know it was lengthy, but it's hard to condense truth on a subject of global proportions. There are so many other details we could get into, but then we'll be here all day. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Please be sure to like and share this video. And until next time, thanks for watching Inverted World. I was busy that day. I did not blow up Nord Stream. Uh, thank you, though.